Dr. Rico here. This is an introduction to my mini course, Robotic Planning and Kinematics. The syllabus link and notes are in the description. All right, welcome to lecture 2.2, Workspace Decomposition, part of the Motion Planning via Decomposition and Search chapter. We begin with a little introduction. We start with two useful geometric ideas. The first, convexity. As mentioned in section 1.6, a set S is convex if for any two points, P and Q in S, the entire segment P to Q is also contained in S. Examples of convex and non-convex sets are drawn in figure 2.3. We see here a convex set where between any two points, call them P and Q, as we did. You can draw a line without leaving the set. A non-convex set has at least one pair of points for which the line in between them would leave the set. And here's another type of example where we have a hole in the set, although that isn't required for a non-convex set, this being a non-convex set that doesn't have a hole. So, convexity. All right. Here we assume that the set S is a subset of the Euclidean space RD for some arbitrary dimension D. For polygons, convexity is related to the interior angles at each vertex of the polygon. Each vertex of a polygon has an interior and an exterior angle. The interior angle is the angle that is pointed toward the set. The exterior angle is the angle that's away from the set. A polygonal set is convex if and only if each vertex is convex, i.e. it has an interior angle less than pi. A vertex is instead called non-convex if its interior angles are larger than pi. So here we have in the same figure, a convex vertex where the interior angle, the angle pointed toward the set, is less than pi, 180 degrees. And for a non-convex vertex, we have the interior angle being greater than pi. All right, so planning in non-convex sets via convex decompositions. Let us now use the notion of convexity for planning purposes. If the start point and goal point belong to the same convex set, then the segment connecting the two points is an obstacle-free path. If, instead, the workspace is not convex, then the following figure and algorithmic ideas provide a simple, effective answer. And this is called the decomposition into convex subsets. For complex, non-convex environments, we use an algorithm to decompose the free workspace into the union of convex subsets, such as triangles, convex quadrilaterals, or trapezoids, quadrilaterals with at least one pair of parallel sides. The following nomenclature is convenient. One, the triangulation of a polygon is the decomposition of the polygon into a collection of triangles. And two, trapezoidation of a polygon is the decomposition of the polygon into a collection of trapezoids. We allow some trapezoids to have a side of zero length and therefore be triangles. This is the degenerate case of a trapezoid. All right, so we can take a look here and think about planning through a space. So the work, free workspace here is certainly non-convex. It has holes in it, right? You could draw a point between, say, here and here, and it would go through the obstacle and therefore leave the free workspace. So we are going to have a free workspace that is non-convex. So we want to split that up into a bunch of convex subspaces. And that's what we've done in part B here. In B, in the figure, we've got a bunch of smaller trapezoidal subsections, okay? Uh, and these, each of them is convex. So within that trapezoid, there is no obstacle, okay? You can go from any point 
to any other point in a straight line without a, a, encountering an obstacle. So you could say start in this trapezoid, move to this trapezoid, to that trapezoid, to this trapezoid, and avoid all of your obstacles. Okay, so that's generally the plan that we're going to have to navigate a space by splitting it up into trapezoids. It is easy to see that a polygon can be triangulated or trapezoid-aided in multiple ways. For example, consider the two possible diagonals of a square. You have a square, you could cut it this way or you could cut it that way across the diagonal and you would get different polygons or triangles in this case. In what follows, we present an algorithm to trapezoidate, i.e. decompose into trapezoids, a polygon with polygonal holes. So here is the sweeping trapezoidation algorithm. Input is a polygon, possibly with polygonal holes. The output is a set of disjoint trapezoids whose union equals the polygon. Step one, initialize an empty list T of trapezoids. Step two, order all vertices of the obstacle and of the workspace horizontally from left to right. Well, left to right for you. For each vertex selected in a left to right sweeping order, so again, this way, four, extend vertical segments upwards and downwards from the vertex until they intersect an obstacle or the workspace boundary. Five, add to T the new trapezoids, if any, generated by these segments and continue to do that repeatedly for each vertex selected from left to right in a sweep. The algorithm is among a class of algorithms studied in computational geometry. Feel free to inform yourself about this topic at Wikipedia. An execution of the algorithm is illustrated in figure 2.5. Note that trapezoids T3 and T7 are degenerate, i.e. they are triangles. So here we go, we've got a workspace that is rectangular, we have an obstacle inside of it, we want to take that free workspace and divide it up into a bunch of trapezoids. And our method for doing that is to take all of the vertices of the workspace and of the obstacle, there's only one obstacle here, but it would be all obstacles in general. And at each point, that we encounter, each vertex that we encounter, we draw a line vertically until we hit something, another obstacle, or in this case, the, uh, the boundary of the workspace, and down, okay? So we're moving our line along uh, from left to right, uh, so on the diagram, from left to right, and every time we encounter a vertex, we draw such a line. This one, when we hit this vertex, we extend up to the uh, workspace boundary and down to the obstacle itself actually bounds this side. Um, this one, you can't go up or down because you'll immediately hit the obstacle. Um, this one, you can go up only. This one, you can go down only. This one, you can't go up or down. This one, you can go down and up, down and up. And you see that these lines actually have, have broken this down into a number of trapezoids, 10 to be exact, trapezoids, T1, T2, T3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And these trapezoids um, now are all, each of them, each of them by, the, by itself is convex. Therefore, we can move from any one point to another point without encountering an obstacle, which is something that we're interested in. So, that is a sort of high level understanding of this algorithm. And we're gonna dig deeper into this algorithm in this next section, the sweeping trapezoidation algorithm. To understand in more detail how the sweeping trapezoidation algorithm is implemented, consider a workspace in which the boundary is an axis aligned rectangle and every obstacle vertex has a unique X coordinate, i.e. no obstacle segment is vertical, okay? 
As an example, see figure 2.5, the one we just looked at. We'll, we'll use this as an example. Since all x coordinates are unique, each line segment, SI, describing an obstacle boundary has a left endpoint and right endpoint, where the x coordinate of the left endpoint is smaller than that of the right endpoint. We write this segment as S sub i, which has a left endpoint, Li, and a right endpoint, Ri. Okay, so this is a segment, has a left endpoint and a right endpoint. All right, this uniquely identifies which segment you're discussing, and so that is what we'll use. Of course, they also have not just horizontal coordinates, you would also need to pair that with a vertical coordinate if you wanted to know precisely where that segment is, but we can denote it simply by left and right endpoint, as we will in the, our discussion of the algorithm. So, to visualize the order in which vertices are processed by the algorithm in step three, we define a sweeping vertical line L moving from left to right. Recall each environment vertex connects two line segments, okay? A vertex is the meeting of two segments at an endpoint, okay? When the line L hits an environment vertex, we categorize it into one of six types. So we're going to look at this table along with the figure and interpret. Okay, so we have these six different vertex types, one through six, and they correspond to the following. So let's take a look at vertex type one. Left and left means that is a left endpoint for both of the segments that meet there at the vertex. So if you have a left and a left and convex, then uh, we will classify it as a type one vertex. Examples are P6, uh, P6 and P8 in this figure. So we'll take a look here. This uh, is a vertex for this segment here and for this segment here. So uh, those two segments are, according to this diagram, S10 and S3. So S10 and S3 both have P8 as a vertex and not only as a vertex, but as a left vertex. So they both have left, left and left. It's also, these are also convex because their interior angles are less than pi. Okay, interior angle less than pi, interior angle less than pi left and left, that's a type one. A type two is a left and left that is non-convex, meaning that it has an interior angle greater than pi. P3 is an example of that. So here we go, is a left endpoint, P3 is a left endpoint for segment S6 and segment S5, but its interior angle is greater than pi, so it is non-convex, all right? So that's P3, that is type two, vertex. Type 3 vertex is a right-right endpoint for the segments, so a right-right endpoint that is convex as an interior angle of less than pi. So examples of those are P2 and P4. Looking down here, we have P2 and we have P4. Notice they're right endpoints for the segments for P4. It's S7 and S6. For P2, it's S5 and S4. Uh, uh, these are right endpoints for those two sets of segments. And the uh, interior angles are less than pi, therefore it's convex. So we have right, right, convex, that's type three, right, right, non-convex, extrapolate from there. Uh, left, right, that's convex, is a type five, left, right, is non-convex, is six. Um, right, left, and left, right, are the same here. Um, there's no ordering that is important. So uh, left, right, and right, left, what matters is it convex or non convex. All right, so these are the different types that we're going to encounter, and we're going to decompose our algorithm based on vertex type. We're going to use the type of any given vertex in the algorithm. So to execute steps four and five of the sweeping trapezoidation algorithm, let's review what, that, what, what those two steps are. So let's bounce back up here. Steps four and five, they're inside the for loop, right? For each vertex that we've encountered sweeping from left to right, 
First, we extend the vertical segments upward and downward from the vertex until they intersect an obstacle or the workspace boundary. Okay, that was four. Five, add to T, which is the set of trapezoids, the list of trapezoids, the new trapezoids, if any, generated by these segments, the new segments that we have created. So let's take a look down here. All right, so to execute these two steps, four and five, of the sweeping trapezoidation algorithm, we maintain a list S of the obstacle segments intersected by sweeping the line L. The obstacle segments are stored in decreasing order in their Y coordinates, just to keep them straight, at the intersection point with L. A key property of S is that it changes only when L hits a new vertex. Thus, when the new vertex V is encountered, steps four and five update the list of trapezoids and the list of obstacle segments S. So the details of steps four and five are as follows and are illustrated in figure 2.7 for each of the six vertex types in table 2.1. So we're going to take a deep look at that in a moment, but uh, let's take a look at these steps first. So the first part of step four is to determine the type of vertex V. So as shown in table 2.1 that we already looked at, we have six different types. First thing to do is to determine which type you're working with, all right? 4.2, so the next part of step four, is to update S by adding obstacle segments starting at V and removing obstacle segments ending at V, okay? I.e., add two segments, remove one segment, and add one segment, or remove two segments depending on vertex type as shown in the figure. All right, we'll take a look at that in a sec. 4.3, so the third part of step four, use S to extend vertical segments upwards and downwards from V. That is, to find intersection points PT and PB above and below V, if any. More detail on this computation is given in the paragraph below, what we'll look at in a few minutes. Step five is broken down into two steps. First one is add to T zero, one or two new trapezoids depending on vertex type, okay? And second part of step five is to update the left endpoints of the obstacle segments in S above and below the vertex V. Okay, so this figure, <clears throat> figure 2.7 is uh, uh, one that we're gonna look at in, in detail. So I'm actually going to show you here this figure and we'll, and we'll walk through each panel. So what we're going to look at is an example of each type of vertex that we outlined in the table above. And uh, uh, the first one is a left left convex vertex. And that was actually this first one you would encounter if you're sweeping left to right. So this is where we start. And what we've got here is the vertex that we encountered is at P8, okay? We extend that line vertically until we hit either another obstacle or the workspace boundary, which we do here. We also extend that vertex line down until we hit another obstacle or we hit the workspace boundary, which we do here. So here are PT and PB. Um, so the first thing that we do is we update S, okay? So S was S1, S2, okay? This is a list of segments, current segments, you could say. All right, that we are uh, encountering with our left to right sweep, our L line, okay? Our L line, um, you could think of it as being a line L that we take and we sweep it from left to right. We encounter these different vertices and at each time that we encounter a vertex, we update S and T and the, the left endpoints of the segments. All right, so that's what we're doing. We've started out, we hit this first vertex and uh, that's that's where we start. So, all right, so we've got uh, to update S. So we're no longer just intersecting S1 and S2. S1 is this upper boundary. It was originally 
this upper boundary, okay? And S1 or S2 was originally this lower boundary. Now that we've hit this point, we've extended up to PT and to PB, um, we had just S1 and S2 uh, being encountered when L was, was in this region. Uh, and now we're going to have some more. So we have S1 still at PT. S10, so we are actually intersecting this S10 segment now as well at this point. And uh, S3, this lower segment, and S2. So we have now S1, S10, S3, S2. So that is updating S. To add to T, okay, T is adding to the, the trapezoids, right? And a trapezoid is going to be described by a bunch of points, and those points will be described here by P's and L's, okay? So we have PT describing the first point in the trapezoid. We have L1 describing the second point in the trapezoid. So PT first, L1 is next. L1 is here. It's the left end point of segment one, okay? That's here. Then L2, which is the left end point of segment two. Then PB. Okay, these are the, the points that define counterclockwise, right? That's how we define a trapezoid, right? A counterclockwise list of points. So there is our trapezoid, and it is a convex trapezoid uh, by construction, right? Okay, uh, update segment endpoints. So now these segments that we're intersecting, we're going to change their definitions. So S1 used to be the entire top boundary here. We're going to update it and say that now S1 is the segment from PT to this old endpoint. So this is the new L1, okay? R1 is still in the same place. L1 used to be over here, right? We used it here to be L1. We'll call it, I don't know, L1 prime is the updated one, just for the sake of the diagram. And uh, uh, now segment one, S1, is considered to be just the segment from L1 prime to R1, okay? So this is our uh, uh, new boundary on the left. We do the same thing with segment two, which now we chop off the part to the left and we take PB to be the new L2. And that's what we see in this last set of updates that L2, and L1 become PT and PB. All right, so that was a type one vertex. Let's look at a type two vertex. So we've gone along, we've done the sweep left to right, we've hit these guys, and now we've come to a left left non-convex vertex, which is of course a type two. And this type two vertex, um, we are going from a situation, let's redraw our L, here, remember our, our L line, and we've swept our L line now uh, to the right, to the right, to the right, and okay, so when we're here, we're encountering, of course, S1, the top boundary, S7, this segment, S4, this segment, and S2, this segment. So that's what we see here as the old, the old S was S1, S7, S4, S2, okay? And when we hit this vertex, then we're going to update. Now we're gonna update for this point and points to the right. We're now intersecting S1, S7, both of those still. Now we're also intersecting S6, S5, S4, and S2. So the original four were S1, S7, S4, S2, we put in S6 and S5 because now this line L, if we continue moving it rightward, we are going to be, and, and you can see it a little bit better, but it also occurs when we're at P3, this is going to be uh, uh, an intersection with S6 and this is gonna be an intersection with S5. So now we update S to include those, okay? So that's keeping track of those. Do we need to add any new trapezoids when we encounter one of these left, left, non-convex types? 
No, right? Because we can continue moving on um, and have no new vertices. If we draw these lines, there are no new vertices. We actually couldn't follow P3 up and down. There is no PT and there is no PB because we're completely bounded up and down by the object, by the obstacle. So we can't include any new trapezoids. Type 2 vertex. A type 3 vertex is a right right convex vertex and we'll take as an example P4. So we'll draw our left to right moving line here again. We'll sweep it to the right. Here was one, there was one. Every time we encountered a vertex, we did one. We did this one just a moment ago and now we are here, okay? We are I'll put the line L on top of it. And we've got uh, a PT and a PB that we extend from our intersection of the line with the vertex of interest. So there's our PT, there's our PB. And we've defined uh, two new trapezoids, right? We define this trapezoid here and we define this trapezoid here. So uh, the way that we'll keep track of what's going on is first we'll update S, which is to update which segments we're intersecting with L, okay? So when we were just to the left of P4, we were, as you know from the preceding step, because the preceding step happened to be this guy, we had S1, S7, 6, 5, 4, 2, 1, 7, 6, 5, 4, 2, uh, now, when we update, we're going to lose S6 and we're going to lose S7, right? So, if we look here, uh, S6 and S7 are going to be yanked out in our new S. So, so S1, S5, 4, 2, and uh, now we've kept track of S. Okay, so now we need to add to our trapezoid set, right? We have this collection of trapezoids and we need to, to add to that. So we have uh, PT, L1, L7, P4. And that one is defined by, so we start out at PT right here. PT, okay. We're going to go counterclockwise. So PT, this is the left endpoint of the S1 as it was defined in this uh, uh, step. So S1 in this step is this segment here. So its left endpoint is defined here. So there's our L1. Then we continue to go counterclockwise and we come to this vertex here, which is actually the left endpoint of L7. L7. And we end at P4, the vertex itself. So this was uh, uh, this guy right here. Now, what if we took a look at this trapezoid, which is actually degenerate, right? It's only a triangle. But uh, we start off at P4 here. We go counterclockwise to this vertex. So it's the left endpoint of L6. Uh, it's also the left endpoint of uh, 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 segment 5, so it could be L5. But we're going to take 6 because it's the one that's actually um, connected to P4. So we'll take that. Uh, and then we will come along here to PB, which will be the final node of this trapezoid. So it's triangular. Of course, we need to update our endpoints. So L1 okay, is now going to be chopped again. So this old S1 will become a new S1 over here and uh, it'll get a new left endpoint, L1, uh, which will be right here. And so we'll call it to prime just for this step. And uh, we also have chopped S5, right? S5 is now going to be shorter. We'll chop it off here and we'll call this the new L5. So that is uh, that steps. So this was a right, right convex vertex. Okay, four, type four, right, right, non-convex vertex. We had this occur. Um, let's reuse actually our, our L because we can, right? Why not? Uh, we'll continue sweeping to the left. We hit this, we hit this. Okay, 
this guy here. This is a right-right non-convex vertex, and we're sweeping left to right, which is why the right-right and left-left ones are different, right? So, so type 4, right-right, non-convex, update S first. So we were here, we had S1, S8, S9, S10, S3, S2. Okay, those were the segments we were intersecting with L. That was this list here. And now we're going to uh, uh, see what our updated list is going to be after we pass this point. It's especially obvious after we pass the point. So we see S1, S8, S3, S2. S1, S8, S3, S2. That'll be our, those will be our new S's, okay? So if we stay here um, at our intersection, we can't go up or down. We have no PT, we have no PB, okay? We can't extend this line up and down from our vertex. So the only way that this um, sweep will have ended in a trapezoid is if we've got this exterior angle trapezoid to consider, which we do. So uh, this is going to be an endpoint of the trapezoid. This is going to be a vertex of the trapezoid. So uh, this trapezoid needs to be added uh, to our list of trapezoids. So we start at P7, and we move counterclockwise to this point, which is the left endpoint of 9, right? This is L9. And then we come down to here, and we have the left endpoint of S10. Okay, so those are going to be the three points that define our trapezoid. All right. We don't need to update any segment endpoints because we haven't cut with this vertical PTPB line any of our segments, right? S8 will continue on, S3 will continue on, so we're good. All right, so that was a type four. Let's look at a type five, which is a left-right convex vertex. Okay, we'll redraw our left sweeping L here. Our left sweeping L, sweep, 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 sweep. Okay, we get to here, which is a left, right. So left for S3, right for S4, vertex P1. Okay, so we've got uh, to update our S1. We were going through S7 and S3. Now we're going to be going through S7 and S4. So that was a, a pretty easy update. We turned S3 into an S4 in our S, keeping track of the segments we intersect from top to bottom with the line L. Okay, so we updated S. We're going to update T now, which is we need to add the trapezoid that was created. That trapezoid that was created is the trapezoid that is contained to the left of L with the line L being its right side. So we're going to take P1, L3, L2, PB. So P1, L3, and then we've got S2 ending at PB. So here we are with our trapezoid. Now, we add this to T. We need to update our segment endpoints. Uh, only one of those needs to be updated, and that is L2 needs to be PB. So S2, now we have a new S2 here that has left endpoint L2, we'll call it prime. L2 used to be this, right? And now we updated it to this. All right, so the last one now, type six. Type six, left, right, non-convex vertex, okay? Left, right, non-convex because the interior angle is greater than pi, vertex. P5. So let's take a look here. We've moved our line L sweeping along here. We were here, so we were uh, with S as S1, S8, S3, S2, the different segments that we intersect with L. And we're going to transition that to on the other side, we're going to have S1, S7, S3, S2. So really, we just went from S8 to S7. That's the only difference on either side of this. So that was our update. Uh, our add to T now is, if we put this line on 
P5. Then uh, we've got to update with, we'll start out at PT, as we like to do, and go counterclockwise. We need to know what this point is. This is the left endpoint of S1, so this will be L1. Now we're here, the left endpoint of S8, going to be L8. And then the vertex itself at P5. So this is our new trapezoid here. We need to update the left segment for S1. Our new S1 is going to be over here, and the new L1 endpoint, which we'll call L1 prime, is going to be PT. So that's what we do with this update of the endpoints. All right, so back now to the lecture, and we've gone through in detail now what happens for each of these different types, and we've looked at an example. Okay, so the type of vertex V can be determined by checking its convexity and looking at the number of obstacle segments in S that have V as an endpoint. Zero obstacle segments implies V is of type one or two. One obstacle segment implies V is of type five or six, and two obstacle segments imply V is of type three or four. So you can differentiate between one, two, five, six, three, four, if you have uh, also the convexity, right? The point PT, respectively PB, is defined as the point where the vertical segment extended upward, respectively downward, from V intersects an obstacle. In types one and three, both PT and PB are defined. In types two and four, neither are defined as the upward and downward vertical segments, as we saw, immediately enter obstacles. In types five and six, only one of PT and PB is defined. Instruction step 5.2 updates the obstacle segments in S to facilitate the following computations of trapezoids. All right, so we're going to figure out now what is the big O notation for the algorithm runtime. So runtime analysis of trapezoidation algorithm. Given a free workspace, i.e. workspace minus obstacles with n vertices, the sweeping line is implemented, as in steps one and two, by sorting the vertices from left to right. That is, in increasing order of their x-coordinates. There are many well-known sorting algorithms, including bubble sort, merge sort, quick sort, etc., and the best of these run in n log n where n is the number of items to be sorted. Next, for each vertex v in the sorted list, we perform the steps detailed in figure 2.7 that we just discussed at length. The runtime of these steps is dominated by the time needed to insert new segments into S and delete old segments from S. There are exactly two insert delete operations for each vertex v, one for each segment that has v as an endpoint. If we maintain S as a sorted array, then to insert or delete a segment, we need to scan through the array. Since there are n segments, the array can contain at most n entries, and insertion or deletion requires o n time. We repeat this procedure for each, remember it's a for loop, right, of the n vertices, giving a total runtime of o n squared. We can improve the runtime by using a more sophisticated data structure for S that allows us to insert and delete segments more quickly. In particular, a binary search tree can be used to maintain the ordered segments in S. A segment can be inserted or deleted in order log n, instead of order n time for the simple array implementation. With a binary tree, the sweeping decomposition algorithm can be implemented with a runtime belonging to order n log n for a free workspace with n vertices instead of order n squared, right? Uh, log n is better than n, um, and n log n is better than n squared. The details of binary trees are beyond the scope of this book, but can be found in Corman et al. and in Berg et al. or on Wikipedia. All right, navigation on 
roadmaps. Before proceeding, let us recall the three key ideas we've introduced so far. Convexity leads to very simple paths. Two, if the free workspace is not convex, it is easy to navigate between neighboring convex sets. Three, a complex free workspace can be decomposed into convex subsets via, for example, the sweeping trapezoidation algorithm that we looked at extensively. The next observation is that the sweeping trapezoidation algorithm and other decomposition into convex subsets procedures can easily be modified to additionally provide a list of neighborhood relationships between trapezoids. In other words, we assume that we can compute an easy to navigate roadmap. The roadmap of a trapezoidation is computed as follows. An example is drawn in figure 2.8. So let's look at this algorithm along with the corresponding figure here. So input, the trapezoidation of a polygon, possibly with holes. Okay, so that's what we've got uh, denoted with the white squares and the gray lines showing us each of the sides of the trapezoid, the parallel sides of the trapezoid, and um, the outer boundary also being included in that. Output is a roadmap, that's what we're looking for. Step one, label the center of each trapezoid with the symbol diamond. Okay, so we have a diamond at the center of each trapezoid. We won't worry too much about how you figure out what the center is or if it even matters for the moment, but we've got each of these trapezoids with a center now, with a diamond. Label the midpoint of each vertical separating segment with the symbol dot. So we have a dot here, a dot here, a dot here, a dot here, a dot here. All of these dots are the midpoints of the vertical separating segments. For each trapezoid, connect the center to all the midpoints in the trapezoid. So, for instance, if you take this, here's the center, here are the different midpoints that correspond to this trapezoid. This trapezoid has four midpoints, so we connect them all. Uh, this one here only has two, so we connect these two. And uh, we'll return the roadmap consisting of centers and connections between them through midpoints. And what we've got is a roadmap. If you followed this, you could navigate around and avoid obstacles, right? As a result of this algorithm, we obtain a roadmap specified as follows. One, a collection of center points, one for each trapezoid, and two, a collection of paths connecting center points, each path being composed of two segments connecting a center to a midpoint and the same midpoint to a distinct center. Okay, note. It is not important what precise point we select as center of a trapezoid. We will see in the next section that the roadmap can be represented as a special type of graph that is generated from an environment partition and is called the dual graph of a partition. Okay. Consider now a motion planning problem in a free workspace W3 that has been decomposed into convex subsets as we do and that is now equipped with a roadmap, as we've just shown how to do. The planning via decomposition plus search algorithm described below provides a solution to this problem by combining various useful concepts. So here we go. The input is the free workspace, a start point, and a goal point. The output is a path from the start point to the goal point if it exists, otherwise failure is returned and uh, either outcome is obtained, either failure or a path is returned in finite time. Step one, compute a decomposition of W3 and the corresponding roadmap. Okay, so decompose it, that was what we learned above in detail. And then the roadmap was pretty straightforward to create from a decomposition, and we do that. And notice you can go, uh, if you're on this road, uh, if you follow the roadmap, you can actually go from any convex trapezoid in the free workspace to any other convex free trapezoid in the workspace if you follow the road, the yellow brick road, right? So, very dated reference. Two, in the decomposition, find the start trapezoid, delta start, containing P start, and the goal trapezoid, delta goal, containing P goal. So, here is delta start, the trapezoid that contains P start right here. Here's delta goal, the trapezoid that contains P goal here. So we've got uh, 
our start, our start and our goal trapezoids. All right, delta start, delta goal. Three, in the roadmap, search for a path from delta start to delta goal. Four, if no path exists from delta start to delta goal, return failure notice. Else, return path by concatenating the segment from P start to the center of delta start, the path from delta start to delta goal, and the segment from the center of delta goal to P goal. So essentially, finding a path, so um, in the roadmap, search for a path from start to goal. So you start at P start, you go to the center, the diamond for that trapezoid, delta start. You know once you've gotten there, you're connected to the road. You try to find a path along that road from that point to the center point of delta goal. Once you get to the center point of delta goal, you're guaranteed to have a path to P goal because there are no obstacles within delta goal. There are no obstacles within delta start. So you're guaranteed if you can find a path through from delta start to delta goal to have a path from P start to P goal. And that is how you make a plan using this decomposition. Note, by means of the decomposition, we have transformed a continuous planning problem into a discrete planning problem. A path in the free workspace is now computed by first computing a path in the discrete roadmap. And this discrete roadmap, searching for that path, is what we'll turn to in section 2.3. See you next time.